Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may your hearts be filled with the full joy and assurance that because Christ has died and risen, defeating all sin, death, and our enemies, that we live free in the gospel. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for defeating our enemies, giving us your great freedom. Help us each day to live lives that are free in you, not free from you. Forgive us for those times when we turn from you, but restore us each day, knowing that you are our resurrected Lord, and you are the resurrecting Lord, giving us new life. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Vincent van Gogh was a 19th century painter, probably most well known for his painting, The Starry Night. And if, you, if you're not familiar with him, you've probably seen The Starry Night various places before, but you may not know the history of The Starry Night. Vincent van Gogh was a very disturbed man. He was actually institutionalized in a mental institution in southern France, and much of his time was spent confined to his room or confined to the institution. At times, he was allowed to go out onto the grounds, but for the most part, he was confined to his room. And so paintings like The Starry Night and many of his other paintings were actually what he saw through the window. As he sat confined in the institution, it's what he saw. As I said, he was very disturbed. He was a man who struggled not only with the confines of the building, but the confines of his own mind. He wrestled with his own mental distress. He wrestled with seizures, with difficulties facing reality. There was no relief, or very little relief. He had a brother by the name of Theo. And while he was institutionalized, his brother Theo sent him a short letter. Included in that short letter, though, was a small etching from Rembrandt. Rembrandt being a 17th century pa- uh, artist. And Rembrandt, the, the, the etching that Theo included from Rembrandt, was the raising of Lazarus. And when Van Gogh saw this etching, this painting, it completely changed his heart, his life. When he saw it, he couldn't even put into words the way that it changed him. So much it, it, did it change him, though, that he had to etch his own raising of Lazarus when he saw the resurrecting Lord. What is interesting about this painting, this etching by Rembrandt, is if you look, you see Jesus, the lone figure, standing there, majestic and powerful, ruling over all. But none of the eyes are facing him. Instead, all of the eyes, they, they're pointed at Lazarus, instead of looking to the one who gives life, they're looking at the one who has been given life. But for Van Gogh, the resurrecting Lord brought beauty and hope, brought to him comfort even in his institutional setting. A small letter, paint on a canvas of the resurrecting Lord brought hope. Today we we have a letter as well, don't we? A letter from, from Paul to the people in Rome. As he wrote to that Roman church, he, he was looking to do the same thing. He was looking to show them the resurrecting Lord. He was looking to show to them that beautiful image of what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To see Jesus in your life. The hope, the beauty, and the comfort it brings. He was looking to show them the great joy that he had experienced. So much so that as he begins his letter, he he begins it like as a servant for a great king like Caesar. He says, I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. But his king was greater. His king was the Savior. But really, the theme of his book doesn't get picked up until verse 16 of chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Let me read that again and listen. Just listen to it closely. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the power of the resurrecting Christ, whether on paint on a page or words in in text. It is the power of Christ coming to us, bringing us hope and beauty and comfort and freedom in the gospel. And Paul knew something about this, didn't he? Because Paul, formerly Saul, came into direct contact with that resurrecting Christ on the road to Damascus, as he was traveling, uh, planning to bridge, carry out murder, carrying death on this, these people who followed Jesus, who he only perceived to be a prophet. 
his life was changed forever when he came into contact with the resurrecting Christ. When he stopped on that road to Damascus, when he was blinded, his eyes were truly opened. And he saw Jesus. And much like the way it changed those hearts of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it changed Paul heart, Paul's heart. As it gave the, the disciples who were locked away for fear of the Jews after the crucifixion of Christ, hope and, cel- to, and reason to celebrate, it changed the heart of Paul to help be full of hope and celebration. As it pierced the heart of Mary in that garden, as she cried out, Rabboni, teacher, it pierced Paul's heart as he came into contact with the resurrecting Lord. Because that's what happens when you come into contact with the resurrecting Lord. He changes hearts and he changes lives. He changes our lives in ways that we cannot imagine or expect or plan for. When we come into contact with that resurrecting Lord, Christ Jesus, we see our Savior. And sometimes it's hard to see our Savior, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to see the resurrecting Lord around us. Much like in the Rembrandt etching, where all the eyes were facing elsewhere than Christ, so often isn't that the case for us? For people today, our eyes are facing somewhere, anywhere but to Christ. Just look back to our epistle reading for this morning from Romans chapter 7. The people, their eyes were not faced to Christ. Maybe they started out there, but then they, they, they get, grew transfixed on the law. Who could blame them? The law had been such a part of their life, their whole lives. How they lived, how they'd been taught, how they ate, how they drank, how they behaved with one another had been governed by the Torah, by the first five books of the Bible. But they'd lost sight of the Christ. They'd lost sight of the resurrecting Lord and exchanged it for that sight of the law. What was familiar, what was comfortable, what they were used to. And the problem is, when you all you see is the law, is all you see is sin, and all you see is death. Because that's the job of the law. The job of the law, as Paul says it, is to show us our sinfulness, to show us what we deserve. Just look back to our text for today from Romans 7. and I'm just going to read a couple of verses here, but I encourage you to read, read it carefully and see what Paul is telling us about the law. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul's very own words. He was writing to that Roman church who had grown transfixed on the law, not realizing that they'd lost sight of the resurrecting Lord, the hope and the beauty and the comfort that they needed. They'd grown so transfixed on the law that they lost sight of that hope. And so Paul reminds them that they do not merely live under the law, which shows us our sin and death, but they live in the Spirit, the Spirit of God's grace who has brought to us that message of the resurrecting Lord, that has brought to us the promise that no longer are we in the arms of an angry God, as Jonathan Edwards wrote in his famous sermon, but we are in the gracious arms of our loving Savior Jesus Christ. No longer are we bound by our sin, but we have been set free by God's grace, by Jesus' own precious sacrifice on the cross for us. Now, freedom, it's something that's familiar to us as Americans, isn't it? It's something that's familiar to us as as we think about our day-to-day lives, isn't it? We think about freedom a lot because it's part of who we are. We pride ourselves on our freedoms, our freedom of speech, our our freedom of, of religion, our freedom to complain about the government and go on and go on. That's just the First Amendment, right? But sometimes I think we have a tendency to read God's Word with that same bias, with that same lens. We read God's Word as if we have freedom to rewrite it, shape it, mold it, form it, however we'd like it to be, however it makes us most happy, whatever is most fitting and comfortable to us. We look at that law and we massage it. Because after all, we are free in grace, right? We read verses like Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we hear God telling us, the Israelites, us, to bind his law upon our wrists, upon our foreheads. 
when we feel like that's bondage. God's law holding us back from who we are meant to be. Christianity full of rules, regulations, keeping us from having fun. Instead of following others, we're supposed to follow Jesus. Instead of loving ourselves, we're supposed to love others. God's law calls for a higher standard, doesn't it? But so often with our American state of mind, with the way we live, we're content to re- look at God as if he's a grandpa who's just waiting to hand out his Werther's original candy to all of his little children. His word, it's, well, that's just Old Testament law. We're in grace now. But that's not what Paul ever intended. And that is what we call cheap grace. Because without the law, we cannot celebrate the gospel, the resurrecting Christ. Without the law, we cannot see our sinfulness, our brokenness. We cannot see who we are and what we deserve. It is only by the law that we can see how much we need God's grace. How much we need Jesus Christ to set us free. So often we think that we're free when we weasel out of God's law. We think we're masters of our own destiny, but in truth, we're actually binding ourselves to a different master. We're binding ourselves to a master who is vicious and hateful, who desires nothing but our own destruction and death, and that is Satan. We don't truly free ourselves when when we move away from God's law. We bind ourselves under Satan instead. And that is why we need a Lord, a Savior, a resurrecting Christ who can defeat Satan. That is why we need Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Why Paul, throughout the, gospel, throughout the epistle of Romans, points us to the gospel that Jesus Christ did in fact defeat Satan, did in fact defeat death and defeated the law. But not to erase the law, but to set us free. To set us free to be those people who live with hope with the promise. Because just a chapter earlier in Romans, Paul writes some really beautiful words that remind us that even though we're going to die, even though we're going to experience the punishment for sin is death, we have hope. He writes in Romans chapter 6, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. That is the power of the resurrecting Christ. To bring life to our dead bodies. To bring life to us who are covered in our trespasses, setting us free from the bondage of sin. To live freely not from God, but freely in God. To not live free from the law, but to live free to obey God's law. To open our eyes to see that God's law is not meant as a burden, as a bondage, binding around us but it's meant to shape and form us god's law given to us at the creation of the world was meant to give us lives that were simpler lives lives that follow him notice i didn't say easier lives because our lives are still going to be hard they're still going to be difficult they're still going to be painful and temptation is going to come because when we know jesus christ as our lord and savior the devil will work twice as hard if not more to try to drive us away drive us from that hope and beauty that comes in the Lord. But Jesus gives us strength, the resurrecting Lord. He sends to us his Holy Spirit. He gives us guidance by his Holy Word, so that as we go through his Word, as we learn from his Word, as we follow his path, he shows us his way, a way of hope. You know, when Van Gogh painted his Raising of Lazarus. His painting, while reminiscent of Rembrandt, was also very different. And instead of the big picture, he focused in on one little detail. See, there was this detail that Rembrandt included but was not important. But it was full center. Was that as Lazarus was being raised, it had Mary pulling the bandage off of Lazarus' eyes. Now as Van Gogh painted this, Christ is not present in the painting. Lazarus can't see him. The sisters can't. We can't see him. 
But he is there. He is there because although we cannot yet see our Christ, our Savior, our salvation, he is there. And what's even more remarkable is if you look closely at Van Gogh's painting of that raising of Lazarus, if you look right at the face of Lazarus, you'll see a pale, thin, red-bearded man, the face of Van Gogh himself, the face of each of us, that we too shall rise. As Jesus gave life, life to Lazarus, as Jesus rose from the grave, we too shall rise. That is the hope of the resurrecting Christ in our life. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we give thanks to you for sending to us your Son, Christ Jesus, who has brought to us life in the midst of this world of death. Forgive us for those times when we exchange your law for our desires, for our wants. Forgive us for those times when we exchange your grace for cheap grace. But lead us to know that your law shows us our sin, shows us who, what we deserve, but it is your grace that reminds us, that reassures us that we are forgiven, that you have forgiven us by your precious suffering and death on the cross. May this be our hope. May this be our comfort. May we know that you are our resurrecting Christ who brings hope and beauty to our world, who will bring greatest, the greatest hope and beauty when we rise with you. May this be our hope this day and forevermore. Amen.